here this morning. My name is Karen Rose, and um, I'm the uh, Senior Director for Strategic Development and Planning at the Internet Society. And um, we've structured today as, a, as an informational session and, and are hoping to um, get your questions and, and have some interaction around the floor. Um, so we'll be really informal um, today. But just to kick things off, as many of um, you may know, um, the Internet Society is a global nonprofit organization founded in 1992 by some of the early pioneers of the Internet. And our mission is to promote the open development, evolution, and use of the Internet for all people throughout the world. Uh, we're also the organizational home of the Internet Engineering Task Force, which was the open forum that was right before ours in this room. And the IETF works to establish the open and voluntary standards that make the Internet work. So really by working with a very broad community, and we'll talk a little bit about um, some of our uh, community uh, outreach and our outreach around the world today, but working with a very broad-based community and um, helping really to connect the world and advocating for an open and sustainable Internet, we really strive to make the world uh, a better place. Um, ISOC is a truly global organization. At present, we have five regional bureaus, uh, including in Africa, Latin America and the Caribbean, Europe, North America, Asia Pacific, and we'll be opening our sixth regional bureau very soon um, in the Middle East. And we're very excited about that and our ability to uh, reach more individuals and more deeply in that very important region. We have 99 local chapters around the world, uh, literally from Argentina to Zimbabwe. Um, so our community and our footprint is truly global. And um, if I can see a show of hands, how many of you here are Internet Society members, individual members? All right, well, congratulations. Uh, you're among a community of some 50,000 people across the world that are Internet Society members that are committed to advancing our mission. And if you're not an Internet Society member, uh, you can join up for free on our website at internetsociety.org. Well, since the um, theme of this IGF is building bridges, uh, enhancing multi-stakeholder cooperation for growth and sustainable development, we thought we would try and focus a lot of our discussion around uh, the work that we do in internet development and capacity building and access assistance and other types of projects around the world. Um, and since our founding in 1992, internet development has been key and core to the Internet Society. Um, the key in the early founders of the Internet Society and the Internet wanted to spread this technology around the world, and one of the reasons that they formed the Internet Society was to do just that. Uh, and in fact, between 1993 and 2002, almost every country connecting to the Internet between that time, between 1993 and 2002, did so with the help of Internet Society workshops um, and other assistance from the Internet Society itself and also our broad range of partners and members. Um, of course, putting such a great focus on um, internet development and really looking to achieve sustainable re uh, results requires a big effort. And it really requires a big effort throughout our entire organization. Uh, in fact, that there are few places in our organization that don't touch on fundamental internet development issues in some way or another. Um, in addition, our broad community and the broad range of partners we work with um, also touch on development issues. So it truly takes a community, and that goes within uh, the Internet Society itself and our many um, uh, uh, partners uh, external to the organization. So what I'd like to do in just a moment is, is turn it over to some uh, other individuals in the organization to talk a little bit more about their work. Um, with an emphasis on development and also some other areas of, of their interest. Um, but before I do, just very briefly, I'd really like to um, talk about a couple of key takeaways, real three key takeaways that we've had um, in our 20 years of experience in development. So sustainable internet development, how you really get the internet to develop and grow in a sustainable way in countries, 
it's not just built on technology alone. It's not just built on boxes and wires and blinking lights. What we've seen over our 20 years of experience is that internet development projects that just focus on technology alone usually fail. So over our 20 years, we, we've really sort of uh, looked at some real key factors that make the internet sustainable. And we call this approach the smart development approach. So what is smart development? Smart development is really a holistic approach to internet development and capacity building that focuses on three fundamental pillars that's required for really any internet development project at any scale to really succeed. First of all, it's the technical infrastructure that's needed. Of course, when you're dealing with the internet, you are dealing a lot of times with the physical infrastructure. How do you make connections? How do you make connections more efficient? Um, how do you make things go faster? You're dealing with the boxes and wires. That's only one element. The second element, of course, is the human infrastructure. Do you have people on the ground that have the skills, the knowledge, and capacity to sustain any project or to grow any project um, that's on the ground? And third of all, um, the third piece of infrastructure is governance infrastructure. So what are the policies that are in place, the procedures that are in place um, on a countrywide basis, things such as regulatory issues, fraud, public policies are, that are in place to sustain development, or even on a smaller level, like a particular project, what are the governance mechanisms? Who's going to be responsible? How are um, uh, responsibility going to be associated around um, the community that's supporting a project? So the three pillars, again, of a smart development approach that really any development project, whether it's broad level, governmental uh, wide, country wide, or regional wide, or small project wide, is to look at three major things. So the technical infrastructure, the human infrastructure, and the governance infrastructure that's going to make the project work. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn to some of my colleagues um, for them to um, give you an overview of some of the projects that we work on and some of the different activities across um, ISOC on a broad basis. Um, so I'd first like to uh, introduce uh, Jane Coffin. Jane, if you could introduce yourself and talk a little bit about our work on Internet Exchange Point. Good morning. We're going to roam around the room to make this a bit more inclusive and um, interesting for all of you, we hope that we're not just going to sit um, up at the table. Um, I'm Jane Coffin. I'm the Director of Development Strategy. I work for Karen, but I also, more importantly, work across the teams in the organization, try to, and then work with partners like many of you in the room, people that have been here at this meeting, um, to do what we do to help promote more sustainable internet development. And as Karen is saying, it's the human, the technical, and the governance infrastructures. The bottom-up community support, a support in many communities where we work, help do what we do. This, the theme of this conference is very key to uh, what we also try and do around the world, is build the bridges to connectivity through people, the technology, and the bottom-up internet governance model. What I do specifically is work with Karen, Sophie, others in this room, who will meet, and Sebastian, to try and work with communities to help build some of that infrastructure. One of the projects that I'm working on is something called an IXP, Internet Exchange Point Toolkit and Best Practices Project. This is through the, um, the, a kind grant from the Google Foundation. There are no technical parameters required by Google for this project. What we've seen around the world is that IXPs are key to local connectivity. It, they keep local traffic local. You may have been in some of the sessions this week on Internet Exchange Points. If not, check out our website at internetsociety.org under development. There's a whole segment on ISP. So working with these communities of interest to build this infrastructure, as Karen's saying, it's the technical, the boxes and wires, but the boxes and wires don't walk by themselves. We often say that building ISPs is 80% social engineering and 20% technical engineering, something that Sebastian and Karen and others have found around the world and with the experts that we work with. Um, Sophie may talk about another project we have in Africa, but this global project that we're working on, the toolkit, is a report and best, pa uh, best practices, but also a portal. We're trying to be a door to other doors and give you information through a website. In addition to that website, we'll be doing training around the world. 
focused on those best practices and a methodology for how you take an IXP from the, the initial stages of development to the middle stages to more advanced stages. We would love help from all of you if you're interested in helping us grade the report, help us with training, take a look at the methodologies we'll be putting out. All of this will be on our website. And uh, key again to what we're trying to do to build that human infrastructure is on the ground work with all of you. We don't go to places where, we not, where we're not wanted. We, we want to work with you. You need to come to us in some ways to ask us for help, and we will see what we can do to help build those communities of interest. Our regional teams around the world, which Sophie will highlight in a minute, really do amazing work. They've worked for internet service providers. They've worked for the IXPs around the world. We've worked for governments. We know all different, the different angles involved in building these communities of interest. And um, it's critical to what we do, but we can't do it without partners. And that's all of you. It's the other internet technical community experts. I see Sierra in the room, the Canadian uh, registry for the CCCLD in Canada, who's been an amazing um, catalyst for growing IXPs in Canada. You may not think that Canada needs IXPs. They do. And in the back of the room, we have Martin Levy, who's been a partner of ours from Hurricane Electric, as well as Nick Hilliard from uh, Ireland, who has an amazing um, IXP software backend management tool. These are the types of people that we work with to try and set up workshops, do what we do, build the communities of interest. The other thing that I'll, I'll highlight that we've seen related to the 20 years of experience, human trust networks. We need to meet the people who are doing what they do on the ground that make technology happen. If you don't know someone who you might be exchanging traffic with as an operator, you're not sure, right? We hold for around the world to do just that, whether it's in Latin America, Africa, hopefully soon in the Middle East and other places. We bring people together so that they can actually see the people they might be working with, meet some of us, and extend the benefit of those trust networks of people. It's really something amazing when you start to see the technologists, the policy types, the development types come together and actually make something happen because the technology has succeeded. It's not a failed aid project where lots of money may have gone in and nothing came out. We've seen this around the world replicated through this model that Karen was talking about. So I think I'll stop with that, turn it over to another colleague. But thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, you can always find us on our website underneath uh, who we are and staff. Thank you so much, Jane. And uh, now I'd like to turn to uh, Michael Kende. And Michael Kende is not quite the newest employee of the Internet Society, but uh, pretty close. Michael just joined us as our chief economist. OK, thank you. Um, so I'll just talk about a few projects that I'm going to start. But, but by way of background, um, I, I joined in August. Uh, before that, I was in consulting and did some projects for the Internet Society. And one of them was um, to look at the benefits of an IXP. Now, these were really well understood. People understood you could go to a country, you could go to a company, and explain the benefits of an IXP. But what we decided to do is quantify them. So that instead of saying, this will be great, we could go in and say, this is exactly the benefits that were taking place. And we looked at two uh, very good IXPs, one in Nigeria, and one in Kenya, and we went in and we showed the, the um, improvement in latency by being able to exchange traffic locally, the saving in cost by not having to go to Europe to download traffic. Um, and then we even saw some increases in revenues, and this is largely driven by YouTube or Google putting YouTube caches near these IXPs in Kenya and Nigeria. And what was happening is that the international connectivity was so expensive, people weren't downloading YouTube. It was just too slow, and they gave up. So uh, Google put a cache in Kenya and in Nigeria. And as soon as they did that, suddenly the, the connection time, the download time increased. People started using it more and more. So the amount of traffic tripled pretty much overnight. And um, since the ISPs are charging per megabit in those countries for downloads, their revenues went up. I think in Kenya, we said they went up by $6 million. Um, so really, what we were doing is just kind of putting numbers to things that people understood. And that helps when you go into a new country and say, here's the benefits of an IXP. 
and we can quantify it and you can see the benefits and then the ISPs can see that their, inc their revenues are going to go up and the users can see that they'll be able to download traffic more quickly. Um, so based on that and a few other um, studies that we did uh, similar before I joined, I was asked to join and I joined in August and I'll just like to talk about two new projects that I'll be starting um, here. Both of them really driven by, by uh, observation. So. Um, one of my last projects before joining iStock, I was uh, helping to put an IXP into, um, into the Gambia. And um, they were just about to put a new submarine cable there. And in December, they turned on that submarine cable for two days, and then for various reasons, they shut it down until March. And while we were there, uh, somebody who didn't know about the submarine cable said, uh, since you seem to know a lot about the internet, can you tell me what happened last week? Uh, you know, my family lives in Germany. Every day I try and Skype them. Sometimes the, the voice barely works, but for two days I could do video to my family in Germany, and then it shut off again. So clearly, the two days that the submarine cable was up, suddenly the connection got really good, and, and that's exactly what we want to see. So then I thought, well, this is great. They spent $700 million on this submarine cable that connects eight new countries on the west coast of Africa. Let me see the benefits. And so I tried to find somebody who would invest in this cable who had shown how much better the internet got since these cables went online. And there's no data on that. Nobody thought to just put in some measurement tools to show how much faster the internet got since these so one of the things we want to do is aggregate all the existing data about the performance of the internet and the economic benefits of the internet and we'll put a portal up on our website that has all that um, just so that we can see what's available and then we'll, we'll try and leverage and gather more data and we might, uh, we might have a program where we have something that all of our members can download to their phones or to their computers that will systematically measure the speed Hopefully they'll do it in all the countries that, we're, that we have members in so that we can almost real time see the performance of the internet in these countries. Um, and that has a lot of benefits because if it gets faster, we can send an email to the Gambia and say what happened and they'll tell us that the cable just came online. If it gets slower like it did in Sudan, it was shut off, we can email the members there and say what happened and they can say once it comes back up, they can tell us what happened. So we can get a real time view of the internet with these types of tools. Um, so that's the first project, and that should be going up on our internet within the next uh, three, four weeks. It's really just a portal of all the existing data about performance of the internet, economic benefits of the internet, and then we'll start adding to that. And hopefully researchers and others can use that to, to, to figure out the benefits of the internet around the world. So the second one comes the second project I'm going to look at is to, to build on our IXP work um, in these countries, but driven by the observation that even in a country like Kenya that has a good IXP, that has seen the benefits of the IXP and the benefits of having this Google cache of YouTube videos and how that improves in performance, still doesn't have much local um, content. So the top five websites, Kenyan websites, are the newspapers and radio stations and things, and they're all hosted in Europe. And by hosting in Europe, they save themselves a little money. It's cheaper because there's a lot greater scale if you go to London or somewhere in Germany and put your website, but they're imposing a huge cost on everyone else because if you're sitting in Kenya and you want to read the newspaper, someone has to bring to you every time someone wants to look at it at $120, $200 a megabit uh, per month. So it's a huge cost that they're imposing. And so the project is going to look at how can we get, you know, what can we do? What economic numbers? What, what can we do to get people to bring their content back? Especially to a country like Kenya that has data centers, that has an IXP, that has a, a good government, a good regime, four submarine cables. And once that data is in the country, once people can see the benefits of having it locally, that will hopefully also kickstart more development, more applications, and, and, and a greater concentration. And this is part of this initiative to 
uh, called 8020 in Africa that we're trying to get 80% of traffic in Africa to be local, not necessarily African, but hosted locally by the year 2020. And we'll start that project towards the end of this year. And next year, with some papers, economic benefits, and some other studies going forward. So that's that, and uh, uh, look forward if you have any questions. Great. Thank you, Michael. We'll save questions to the end. And um, I'd like to um, introduce Sophie Madden, who's our Senior Director for Global Services. Thank you, Karen. As, as Karen said, um, my name is Sophie Madden. I'm Senior Director for Global Services, uh, basically working with the regional bureaus. Uh, we have five of those bureaus, as Karen said. We have bureaus in Europe, in, in Europe, in Africa, in Latin America, in the Caribbean, the Asia Pacific region, um, and in, soon to be in the Middle East. Uh, our bureaus are part of our regionalization strategy. Uh, we work together with partners, with stakeholders in the regions, with our chapters, our members, our organizations, so as not only to work with the different uh, partners in the regions, but to listen to the voices on the ground and is to integrate the local and regional mes messages into our priorities and programs and to work to, and to introduce our priorities and programs um, into the regions. And I'm really, really proud to work with all our uh, bureau directors. Some of them are here today. We have Sebastian Belagamba, who is our bureau director in the Latin American and Caribbean region. Um, we, um, we also, today, Raj Singh isn't here. Unfortunately, he had to travel, but we have the new, newest member of his staff here who will be talking to you later, uh, Noel Guzman. Uh, she, uh, she has just joined us, and we're very proud to have her join us. I will also be talking a little bit about our, uh, our development strategy uh, in the different bureaus. Uh, as Karen said, we will be opening a bureau in the Middle East. Uh, we're looking for a regional bureau director uh, and hope to have that bureau director on board before the end of the year. So all those bureaus, we work together and a part of our core uh, focus is really to collaboration. Collaboration with, our, with the other departments, with our colleagues in strategic development, with our colleagues in the public policy department, in the technology department, in the trust and identity department, and of course with chapters, with members, and with other partners and organizations, as Karen mentioned, to do some of the fantastic work that is being done in the region in terms of development. So we, we drive the strategy together towards development, and our bureaus implement the project, as Jane was saying, uh, in terms of technology, in terms of policy, in terms of development. We do capacity building, and I'm just going to represent some of the bureaus that are not here, because the other bureaus will talk give you some of the details of what they do, the bureaus that are here. But in Africa, for example, we have a number of projects in, in the development field, in access and in infrastructure. One of them is the Access Project, which is a project on IXPs in collaboration with the African Union, uh, in which we do best practices workshops and technical assessment workshops all over Africa. It's a multi-year project, and many of you in the room have been in touch with this project um, and, and our fantastic team in Africa, Dawit Bakelim, Chuki Mwangi, and Kevin Chege, uh, and Marsema, uh, all of them have worked very hard to make this a, this a success it is, and obviously as well working with partners, and I call out our partners from the strategic development team as well, who support us in that. And we have just been granted a second project within that context, the Access 2 project, in which we will again continue on that work in, in, in on a more regional basis. Part of the work we do in Africa as well is the AFPIF. The AFPIF is the African Peer and, Peer and Interconnection Forum where we bring together partners. Jane talked about the communities of trust in the African Peer and Interconnection Forum. It's a multi-year project, a forum that has gone now for the fifth year. Soon to be, uh, it was held in uh, Morocco in September of this year again, in which partners are being brought together, in which they can exchange on peering and interconnection on a key uh, element within the, the access and accessibility within Africa. Um, we also work, uh, we also recently had a DNS forum 
just to remind you, as I said, we work on technology, we work on policy, we work on development. We had a DNS forum again in which we worked with the technical community. We brought up some policy issues and technology issues all within the development field as well. In the Middle East, we will also work on that access, the infrastructure, the unserved and underserved areas, the reaching out to the communities, the bringing together the communities, the working with the communities to build that trust. I'm not going to take up any more of the, your time because I want to leave the floor uh, to the various uh, bureau directors or bureau staff that are here. Uh, I do also, before I do hand over to them, I do want to say that our partners, our communities, our chapters, our members are essential to being able to work uh, and to be able to listen and work with the voices uh, on the ground throughout the world. So without our chapters, without our members, without our team members, we could not do uh, the development work that we are proud to do, we're passionate about it, and so we look forward to working with all of you through our region through the, uh, on, on the important work we're doing. With this, um, I would like to give the floor to Sebastian Belagamba, who's our Bureau Director for the Latin American and Caribbean region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our Latin American and Caribbean Euro is based out of uh, Montevideo, Uruguay. Uh, basically, we work with exactly what has been described that I said that. We work in the conjunction of uh, development, policy, and <coughs> uh, uh, so our main task in the, in, in the region is, is to try to uh, implement, to operationalize what uh, ISO globally is thinking strategically case with the uh, strategic development department and also to feed those processes back so in a way that when we think it strategically all the considerations coming from the region are, are taken into account so it's a two-way work that we do um, we implement locally we have uh, locally regionally uh, sub-regionally uh, our region has I would say two main sub-regions that we, we have to touch uh, which are I mean, has their own particularities and, and their own uh, similarities. Uh, I would say that Latin America, Spanish-speaking Latin America plus Brazil is, is one big sub-region. The Caribbean area is another sub-region. It's not just like that. Uh, it's more, much more complicated than that. It's, uh, I mean, Latin America is not just one. Brazil is a Portuguese-speaking country. It's bigger than the other. The Spanish-speaking countries are there. The Caribbean is a mess, too. I mean, we, yeah, uh, there is no such thing as one Caribbean. Uh, yeah, there is English-speaking Caribbean on one side and non-English-speaking Caribbean on the other side. Basically, the Spanish-speaking islands are more Latin America than Caribbean. We have Puerto Rico, which is U.S. instead of being Latin America, but they consider themselves Latin America, so they, they are in, in our region. It's not as simple as I presented, but basically, it, we have two sub-regions. Um, what we do in a day-to-day -day basis is... Uh, implement these programs and um, we're working a lot we are working a lot today uh, mainly in IHPs for instance and, and that is a good example in, uh, in two ways one is helping setting up new IHPs in, in, in many countries that are, that are still lacking their own IHP and the second uh, way is um, to, to helping uh, leveling up the current existing IHPs uh, it's not comprehensive but uh, we are today working with uh, Argentina, Ecuador, Suriname, uh, Honduras, uh, and many other countries that are helping on, on setting up. Uh, the importance of IXP has uh, already been stated, but uh, it is important for us to realize that the better that the better we do, the better that we keep the traffic, the local regional traffic local, the most efficient. And, and fast and inclusive the the, 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 the net is. So <coughs> today, just to give you an example, I mean, most of the traffic in, in, in our countries are exchanged to Miami. Um, even inside our, our own countries, many of our countries, even those that have an IHP, they change their traffic to Miami. And Miami, and if you have a mental map of uh, the Latin American Caribbean region, it's not a small Region. I mean, 
going to Miami from, say, Argentina or Uruguay, it's uh, 8,000 kilometers away. So it's, a, it's a big chunk. Um, even uh, between countries we exchange from Miami, and even inside the country, so some countries, even those that already have an IHP, sometimes they exchange traffic through Miami. So that's something that, uh, that uh, is we, we're working with, and we work that in partnerships. We also like to think that we are in the community building uh, business too, uh, and we help our local and regional communities to, to develop in order to strengthen those communities to, to make the, the whole system more efficient, the, the whole ecosystem more, more efficient. Um, so we partner and we work with different stakeholders. We work with uh, the private sector, we work with uh, the technical community, but we also work with governments. I mean, with Karen Mulberry here, we had a, a very good uh, spam workshop last two weeks ago, three weeks ago, in Mendoza, Argentina, uh, with the uh, uh, telecommunications branch of the Organization of American States. Uh, so that is governments being trained on anti-spam measures. That was basically what the, uh, the workshop was about. So those are two basic examples, and I'm, I don't want to take too much time, but uh, um, IXP's interconnection and traffic exchange, which is even more than purely IXP's, I would say, uh, and, and the spam workshop or many other uh, projects, projects that I can uh, talk about, but uh, I would uh, um, save that for, for the questions and comments period, uh, are, are man, um, some of the, of the things that we're working about in, in Latin America. So I will stop here uh, now and, uh, and I will open the floor to, to questions. I mean, I, I will give myself uh, and make myself available for questions later on and I will invite Noel now to, to talk about the Asia Pacific region. And from there, as you wish. Uh, hi, I'm Noel, and I'm the program manager for uh, the Asia Pacific region. And I'm stepping in today for last night, uh, uh, the regional director who's not here right now. And today I'll be focusing on one of the key projects that we're working in. Uh, one of the key initiatives that we're doing in um, Asia Pacific. Uh, this is specifically being implemented in South Asia at the moment. And this is the Wireless for Communities project. Uh, we started this in 2010 with um, a local uh, organization. It's the um, Digital Empowerment Foundation, uh, which is Delhi-based. And um, uh, the idea behind the project is to overcome the barriers uh, or overcome the costs that are um, that uh, are entailed in deploying uh, wired infrastructure to remote uh, communities. So uh, the solution uh, that would be alternative rather to that is to use instead um, wireless mesh networks as um, a more cost-effective and, um, uh, uh, well, uh, we're hoping more sustainable way of um, uh, bringing internet access to underserved areas. So uh, the strategy that ISOC has em uh, employed for this is to roll out infrastructure and to scale it up. So all of these uh, projects and all of the locations that we've chosen are scalable, which is important in any uh, development measure. And uh, ISOC is involved in um, technical guidance. Um, this is assisting in um, deploying the infrastructure itself and in also in building the capacity of uh, the uh, literacy of uh, computer skills of people who will be using the internet. Um, so each initiative begins with, I don't know space. <laughs> it begins with, um, what we call the training of trainers. Uh, we, we train local people to um, deploy and maintain uh, the wireless infrastructure. And currently, this is con um, workshop to build um, media literacy, uh, computer literacy among the communities, the local communities, it's also carried out. Uh, 
and uh, this is this is the main activity for the initial phase, which was in 2010 to 2011. Since then, we've had two subsequent phases, and uh, for these uh, phases, we focus on um, scaling up. So this is broadening access uh, to both the existing locations, uh, which means building additional infrastructure within the existing locations, and also expanding to other areas. Uh, now we've expanded to beyond India. We've expanded to Dhaka in uh, Bangladesh, and also Timbu in Bhutan. Um, and uh, well, aside from that, aside from broadening access, there we also are now uh, conducting workshops um, to enable locals to not only access the internet but also to create uh, their own content and their own services. Um, and more importantly, uh, we think this is in line with um, the smart development that Karen was speaking about earlier, in that it um, it um, uses. ICT to empower locals um, in, you know, uh, providing internet access uh, that is um, hopefully sustainable, um, and this is done by basically um, uh, transfer. Oh, well, um, how do I say? Enabling locals to own. The, um, the the wireless network, and by owning, we mean that they co-fund it. They co-fund every project, every initiative. They deploy the the uh, infrastructure. They maintain it, and mo most importantly, they use it. Um, and we think that this is this is a key um, a strategy for. Uh, Ensuring that beyond ISOP's involvement, the um, internet in those communities continues to evolve and develop according to the needs and preferences of the locals. Wow. Okay. So in terms of impact, um, we're thinking that these we've we've ha we have increasing evidence that um, we've been successful in our goals to a large extent. The Overall goal basically is to ensure, or to um, there's there's a um, there's a growing um, uh, belief that ICTs enable people to pursue other development goals. And okay, so I think yeah, if you want to know more, there are booklets available. How is it? they look like that? And they're available um, by the door on the chair, and you can also approach me um, after the session. Great. Thank you so much, Noelle. We have um, three short presentations, and then we'll open up the floor to um, your questions. So I'd like to invite Karen Mulberry from our Public Policy Department up. Thank you very much. I'm a policy advisor in the um, ISOC Public Policy Department. We work collaboratively with the development group, with our regional bureaus, on policy issues that appear through both the, the global stage as well as initiatives that have come up both on, uh, from the, the regional perspective. To give you some sense of, of what we look at and, and where we interface, um, uh, for one, it work a lot with the ITU and, and um, WICIT and the initiative that, that Sebastian mentioned came out of the WICIT discussions and from developing regions that they had a concern and an issue and needed a better understanding of what is SPAM and how they ought to address the, the SPAM mitigation um, techniques within their country. So that, that's a collaboration that we do as an example. We also are preparing right now for WTDC, which is the, the World Development Conference. Um, we're looking at what's evolving within the regions as a regional position. Uh, what we can contribute in terms of their capacity building and understanding about the internet and the issues that are on the internet. And in particular, the, the openness is critical to maintaining the internet and its infrastructure. Um, you know, as an area, we're also looking at plenty pot and some of the issues that will be coming up further down the road next year. Um, in, in that initiative, redefining 
the outlook and the structure for the ITU for the next four years. We also work within OECD as part of the techno technology group and the development on some of the, the issues that, that are related to the Internet, and, the, and the, in particular the documents that come out of the OECD that address Internet and Internet-related issues. Uh, we participate in UNESCO. Um, we have a focus on very particular subjects as well, uh, digital content, human rights. You know, it, there's a litany of things that we pay attention to at the, the international and global level and that apply down through our regional process so that we can marry the two visions to move forward with something very common and useful for the internet. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Karen. And um, next we have uh, Terrell Cowison, and she's the Senior Director of Internet Leadership. Thank you, Karen. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this morning. Um, so we're at an interesting time in the evolution of the Internet right now. There's a confluence of developments that undermine the sustainability of the open Internet model as at no other time in its history. And since the inception of the Internet Society, um, we've been very effective at reaching small groups of end users, influencers, technologists, policymakers. But we recognize that as the issues become more complex and nuanced, um, and as the next billions come online, that there are many more that we need to reach. Am I creating shadow puppets over here? Um, and so uh, the Internet Leadership Team was formed at the Internet Society in January of 2011 with two mandates. One was to take a look at how we strengthen the leadership pool to navigate those issues. And then the second was how do we more broadly reach many others. So our work is divided into three areas. One is leadership, so really building that pool of leaders who can navigate the languages between policy and technology because we can't just operate in silos. The second is really around training and working with um, higher education institutions educators and students to train about internet governance and other areas. And then the third is around knowledge. So working uh, to develop assets that we can work with end users to educate them about their rights, roles, and responsibilities around the internet. And so that's really the three core areas in which our work is focused. We have, um, and the emphasis with the internet leadership team is really driving the capacity building strategy to scale our efforts more effectively. And so as I said, you know, we've had lots of success in reaching smaller groups, but how do we scale the work of our subject matter experts and drive the outcomes that we want to see in the regions and with the end users? Our investment areas are in four areas. One is in the experiential programs, and this includes our ambassadors to IGF. We have a few here, and we're very happy to see them. Um, um, it includes fellowships to the IETF, uh, the second investment area is around the learning management system. And so the official announcement that I'm making right now is around INFORM. That's our new learning management system. We actually had a soft launch earlier this year. And this is a learning platform that allows us to deliver courses on topics on internet governance, for example, or um, you know, who are the actors in the internet ecosystem. We're looking at working with our public policy team as an example on a toolkit for regulators working with Karen Mulberry and taking out the work that she's doing in the workshops and region on the span of the So those are just a couple of the examples. The third investment area is in that portfolio of assets to reach end users. So as an example, uh, we've had a trust and identity research arc for the past four years. And so things like how do you manage your online identity? What is the digital footprint? So as part of that portfolio of assets, we launched in January this year some online identity modules. Um, and that is outside of our learning management system, but it's things that people can share via social media. Um, it's right now available in English, French, and Spanish, but we've also gotten requests to translate it into Bahasa, Hindi, and Mandarin. So it's going to be available to those next billions. And then the last investment area uh, is actually investment in convening groups. So as an example, on Monday of this week, we had a collaborative leadership exchange in partnership with some of the other organizations that are also focused on capacity building. So in partnership with Diplo, the uh, Summer School on Internet Governance, Dot Asia, And it's really about strengthening community to go into meetings like this and have a different type of dialogue. And so 
um, so that's the type of investment around convening. And, you know, in closing, I guess I have an ask of all of you. As you hear all of this from myself and from my colleagues, partnerships are essential. The Internet Society is an organization with fewer than 100 uh, staff members, but there's a lot that we all need to accomplish, and we can only accomplish it together. And so, you know, freely reach out to any of us at any point. And uh, I also would just like to say I'm very fortunate to be doing the work that I get to do, both because of my colleagues and also because of working with uh, individuals like our ambassadors and our So, you know, let's all make a difference together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ralph. And um, then we're going to have one last presentation, and that's from um, Joyce Donier and Naveed Haq, who are going to talk about some of our uh, chapter work and um, those activities, and then we'll open the floor to your questions and discussion. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. My name is Joyce Donier, and um, I'm director of chapters. And I'm very pleased to see so many of our chapter officers and members here in the room. So uh, thank you for joining us and for taking the time to be here. Um, I started with the Internet Society back in February. And so um, my role is really to work with the chapters to support their amazing efforts in their region in developing their activities, internet related activities. Um, we work very closely with the regional bureaus, obviously, to develop, to look at the region and to see how we can actually support our chapters best, but also to identify together with them opportunities for new chapter development. Um, and so, very pleased to see that we have a, an almost new chapter in the room as well, by the way. We're just uh, in the last, last little steps to uh, to become a chapter and be a member of the chapter family. Um, obviously, we uh, we have our chapters globally spread. So I'll, uh, to please the number-driven people like Michael, I'll just throw some uh, some numbers at you as well. So as Karen said, we have 99 chapters, almost 100, <laughs> to uh, across the globe. And uh, so looking at the geographical spread, we have. 28 chapters in Africa. I just need to cheat a little bit there. Um, 18 in Asia Pacific region, 28 in Europe, 11 in the LAC region, 12 to be. I'm not putting any pressure on you at all. <laughs> you know. um, six in the Middle East region and eight in North America. And so um, the chapters in each of those regions are really the bridges that for ISOC to the communities. Um, and so we have on our team, and Navid is uh, one, uh, one of our regional chapter managers, but each of the region has their own chapter manager, so feel free to at any time reach out to them to, uh, to actually get some more support if you need some in, uh, in each of the regions. We, um, we actually had on Saturday, a, sorry, on Sunday, rather, a, uh, an APEC chapter regional workshop where we had um, 12 representatives of our chapters, of our chapter officers, plus we had uh, the opportunity to have our IDF ambassadors as well to join us to discuss some of the opportunities for the chapters into developing their activities in each of their chapters. Um, I believe it was a very successful gathering and uh, a lot of bonding has been happening throughout, throughout the workshop but also throughout the rest of the IGF. The, um, this is one part, the chapter workshops, regional chapter workshops, is one piece of the activities that we actually do with our chapters to support them in understanding how to build their communities in their respective regions. And so we are also looking at working with IL, for instance, and using the LMS platform to develop some specific training for our chapter officers and chapter members in each of their chapters. Um, we very often, we use the word chapter very freely, but I very often, and I still have to explain it to my mom once in a while, um, what are chapters? I mean, she still thinks it's something in a book, you know, that you just you know, turn to the next chapter. Um, I'm trying, I'm trying to explain it to her. But so basically, our chapters, for the ones about amongst you who may not be familiar with it, um, our chapters are really independent, um, multi-stakeholder groups that are really formed by our communities for our communities and that actually work within, the, um, within their communities to strengthen and further 
the ISOC mission in their specific regions. And they do that through a number of activities, obviously. Uh, one of the things, and I'll just mention a couple, I mean, they do educational events. They could be training for um, non-technical people, explaining to them what the internet issues are. It could be policy-related activities where they actually um, really talk to their policy makers, to their decision makers about the importance around any kind of internet issues, depending on the region, depending on the area. Um, and that last but not least, also be involved in community programs to really drive um, some of the development work that is being done with the internet uh, society and with the internet communities. Um, I think we can actually look into more specific um, activities that we do in the region here in Asia Pacific. So I'll hand over to, uh, to Navid with one last request for whoever of you who's not active in a chapter, please join them. Please join the chapter. They're doing the amazing work that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, thank you for the ones who are here. And then Navid, if you want to. Thanks. Thanks, guys. So Joyce has already given a bit of introduction of me. I'm Navid Hutt. I'm the Chapter Development Manager for Asia Pacific. Uh, my role is to develop support and assist uh, what amazing work our chapter do uh, in the local communities across Asia. Uh, before I dive into more details here, I just want to announce with a great player that the recent application that we have received is from Indonesia. So we are going to have a chapter in Indonesia in due course of time. So, and it, it, it's coming from the local community from Indonesia, and it's great. And I look forward that we'll have a chapter uh, in the near future uh, in Indonesia as well. Uh, coming back, the whole Asia Pacific uh, uh, picture of the chapters, we totally have 18, and uh, they are well covered uh, throughout the sub regions that we have in Asia Pacific. That includes South Asia, that includes Southeast Asia. East Asia, Australia, and of course, uh, Pacific Island. So the Pacific Island chapter that we have actually is, is, is a sub-regional chapter which covers the whole um, community inside the, uh, the Pacific Island. Uh, these 18 chapters are actually uh, uh, a fantastic group of volunteers. And uh, I'll just show the numbers. We have 9,700 uh, chapter members in Asia Pacific. So you can just imagine how how big the community is and it, it, it will go on growing uh, and of course it, they, these, these volunteers come across uh, and represent our truly multi-stakeholder uh, community voice so so we have volunteers from the technical community academia civil society uh, the internet companies uh, and of course we, we do have volunteers from uh, the government as well so so it's a true multi-stakeholder favor uh, which has been represented uh, through our chapters across the globe and, of course, in Asia Pacific as well. A uh, few of the main activities that the chapters are doing in Asia, uh, so it's, it's, again, a multi-flavor. Uh, they do technical capacity building um, uh, on V6 and the NSEC and, and upcoming uh, internet uh, technological issues. They do campaign and raise awareness regarding issues like access, security, um, privacy, uh, freedom of expression, uh, and, and then they also partner not only with the international organizations, but also with the regional organizations, say, uh, <coughs> sorry, ICANN and APNIC, and, and they just, uh, you know, somehow transform that voice into their community as, as an internet society chapter. Uh, and, and they also partner, a uh, good, uh, good number of the chapters are partnering with the government. So, for example, Australia chapter um, of the internet society basically was... Uh, uh, one of the key stakeholders that set up uh, a national IGA in Australia. So that you know that's just how diverse it, the chapters are, and and uh, they're doing a wonderful uh, job throughout this community of Asia Pacific. Uh, I think I sh I'll just stop over here. Uh, again, like I said, if you want me, I can I, I can I can just show you know I mean this amazing uh, things being done, and and I'm, I'm quite uh, passionate. I'm uh, quite fortunate as well to work with all of you um, in Asia Pacific from the chapter community. So I'll just hand over to Karen. Karen, in case we do have time at the end of the question and session, I would like a few of the chapter leaders who are here, I can see the faces, uh, a bit tiry, but I can see they are still up to share something with all of you 
uh, on that amazing stuff that they're doing for the Internet Society and bringing our mission uh, in their local community. Thanks a lot. Well, we covered a lot of ground um, from uh, economic activities to specific development activities, infrastructure, policy, um, other aspects of development. We've covered Latin America, Asia. So as you can see, the Internet Society, we're truly global. We're truly around the world. And um, we're here to work and make a difference for the communities that we reach, including you. So with that, I'd like to open it up for um, any questions or um, comments or discussion that you have on uh, what you've heard or other things. Anyone in the room? Okay. Here. Okay. Uh, Je voudrais m'excuser et demander peut-être le service de madame pour m'aider à traduire parce que je vais m'exprimer en français. So the, um, the lady is from Gabon and she asked if I could help to translate because uh, she is trying to talk. Bien, donc euh, je vais me présenter rapidement. Je suis madame Florence Lengoumbi. Uh, je suis le conseiller du ministre en charge de l'économie numérique. So, Ms. Florence Lengoumi. 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 Lengoumi works at the ministry uh, uh, and special advisor to the minister of the digital economy in Gabon. Bien, j'ai suivi uh, votre brillante présentation et je remercie tous les orateurs. Uh, je m'excuse si dans mon intervention s'il y a des contradictions par rapport à ce qui a été dit à cause de la langue, je m'excuse déjà, mais euh, c'était une bonne opportunité euh, d'écouter euh, tous les intervenants présenter leurs activités et leurs projets. Et je vous, en, je vous en remercie. Uh, the lady is thanking us for the interventions, for the presentations, and if there are any contradictions in the comments she will be making, it, it, there is a language difficulty, and so please excuse me. Uh, if I may, I will call you Ok. Donc, euh, je vous félicite pour tout ce que vous faites. Uh, Et vous remercie pour la dernière intervention au Gabon. Oui, vous nous avez soutenu financièrement pour euh, euh, l'atelier concernant la mise en place euh, du point d'échange euh, Internet. workshop uh, for the establishment of an IXP in Gabon, which in brackets uh, I intervene here was under the ACTIS pro program, which I mentioned before. Et donc, euh, nous avons encore euh, beaucoup d'autres projets. There are still a lot of projects that are in the pipeline for Gabon. Et nous pensons que ISOC pourra peut-être encore nous aider. And as in many countries, there is that there is the collaboration and cooperation with ISOC and the request to continue to collaborate and cooperate with ISOC. Uh, le projet le plus pressant que nous avons, c'est uh, l'organisation de notre premier forum national de la gouvernance de l'Internet. One of the, the, the prime projects or one project coming up is the organization of the forum on the Internet. Et nous voulons savoir uh, si vous pouvez nous aider, comment on peut faire pour uh, obtenir encore de l'aide and like puisque vous avez intervenu un peu partout dans le monde pour uh, l'organisation des IGF. And like with many countries, the request is how can, how can ISOC help or how can there be partnerships, collaboration with ISOC, like in many countries around the world, for example, with the financing or the assistance in national IGF. Et enfin, d'une manière générale, euh, comment ça se passe pour mettre en place un chapitre dans un pays, euh, quelles démarches faire pour euh, avoir un soutien beaucoup plus fréquent, sauf si ça existe au Gabon, peut-être que je ne suis pas au courant. And there's also the request for assistance in, in establishing a chapter to learn how one establishes a chapter, because right now there's no chapter in Gabon, so there's a request for information on how to go about to establish a chapter. Okay. Et enfin, pour cette présentation, est-ce qu'il y aura un rapport général? Euh, and, finally, and finally, the, re the ask is whether there will be a report on this particular presentation or on this particular workshop. 
Je vous remercie pour votre attention. Merci. And uh, from, uh, from an Africa, je peux répondre en anglais? From an Africa Bureau perspective, as you know, our Africa Bureau works very closely with the countries and identifies the priorities with the countries. Uh, at the workshop you mentioned on access, uh, it, I, I know, I know uh, that the, the team works very hard to be able to um, present the best practice workshop, the first workshop that took place in Gabon. Interestingly enough, it's also, uh, there was also a collaboration with the World Bank since the World Bank is also doing a lot of connectivity projects in Africa and in Gabon in particular, there was a collaboration to ensure that there's um, coherence between the different projects from the donor agencies. And in Gabon in particular, we will still have a technical assessment uh, workshop um, to follow up on the best practices workshop to work with the community that is being established so that with the community, we can move towards the establishment of an IXP in Gabon. Uh, and I have the chapter team, as you saw, you see Joyce uh, Donier. She will be able to sit with you later on as well uh, in terms of chapter development. We have a chapter development support person, Christine Segeter, who's dedicated to Africa in particular, who's integrated into the African uh, team. But uh, Joyce can also give you the context of Christine. And, uh, those are the responses. Thank you, Karen. Okay, thank you very much for your question. And I think um, one of the things this qu this question highlights is the fact that um, you know the internet is a multi-stakeholder community, and it's by working between the technical communities, government, civil society, and others um, that we get our work done. So we're really happy to have you here at this forum and your interest in the work. And we look forward to working with you and. Gabon going forward. So thank you very, very much for being here and your question. Okay, we had one, let me go up here and then here and then there was one back there. Okay. Oops. Um, my name is um, Marina River. I'm from the OECD. And I would like to thank you for a very interesting presentation. And um, I serve as a member of community, but it was great to get really the whole big picture. Um, I would have a question um, to Michael. Uh, Michael, you mentioned that uh, one of your future programs is about local content. And well, we, we had a very successful project together with ISOC and UNESCO local content. Uh, and you basically mentioned uh, that it's about showing how much more expensive it is um, yeah, to have like international traffic, not to keeping content local. So I was wondering whether that project is more like focused on the econometric on an econometric analysis, so that you're coming up with numbers. Okay, how much more um, does it cost? Uh, not exchanging traffic locally, or if you're also coming up with policies, what do you have to do um, in order to incentivize people to create more content? Well, it's uh, neither really. I mean, we're not going to do any econometrics. I think that um, this can be done just with some numbers about the cost. It's, it's really in between, and I have been talking to Konstantinos about the second version, so it's, it's kind of in between. And it's just taking the observation that having local caching and having content available locally should help to promote the creation. So it's really taking that there's a lot of content that is relevant in, in, in many countries, right? It's either the local content that's hosted abroad or global content that people enjoy, games, um, um, TV clips, soccer clips, whatever. So it's really just focusing on, as, as, a, as a first step, taking advantage of local caching and, and hosting opportunities as a way of hopefully kick-starting the generation and that'll feed into, into your next report as I understand it. Um, so it's not focused on the content generation per se, but just what's there, moving it moving it locally. Okay. Great. We have uh, one on the floor here. Uh, thank you. Hello. My name is Nicolas Caballero from the uh, Paraguay soon-to-be uh, chapter. Uh, we've been uh, struggling for the last three years to, to get it approved. And, uh, well, basically I have a suggestion. Um, you know, Latin America is a big continent. So when you say uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, 
the the realities, the the needs, and and you know the things uh, <coughs> are not necessarily the same, right? Uh, the Caribbean is like a whole different world. You know the Andean Andean countries, uh, the the Andes uh, mountains. You know the River Plate region, the Mercosur area, and all that kind of stuff. So my humble suggestion would be to have like sub chapters or sub headquarters or something like that. Not necessarily um, uh, related to administration. I mean, no need to have an, uh, some other offices and, and more people and everything, you know, but uh, I really think we should have like a decentralized uh, kind of uh, administration if possible, right? We can certainly volunteer to help. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nicolas. Uh, Yes, I, I totally agree with you, and that's why we have chapters. Um, so we have chapters to have a local presence. Particularly in Latin America, I think we're fine with having uh, the, um, the, all the Latin Americans uh, and Caribbean. I mean, if you go to, to the level of granularity, you wouldn't, I mean, today Mexico is not the same as Argentina either. So you have to split Latin America too. And, Europe wouldn't be, Eastern Europe and Western Europe would have been separated and the British Islands would be something different and Scandinavia would uh, split also too. So I, I think for the sake of having a, a, a managing, uh, a manageable uh, organization, we should uh, still have these regional bureaus as we have them and have national chapters that will drive our business locally and that would... Uh, represent us there and I will feed us back, I mean, and where we can in, in include their perspectives in, in, in our regional, sub-regional, and global, and global strategy. So I think that's the way, the, the way to go. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We had one question back here, and then um, I'm wondering also if we can go to um, maybe get in a comment from one of our chapters on um, some of the things that uh, one of our chapters are doing, and then we can go back. Hello? Hi, uh, Nick Hilliard from uh, INEX. Um, I had a question to uh, uh, Michael Kennedy about uh, local content and trying to drive. Uh, it's kind of uh, um, a follow on question to the, uh, um, uh, to the previous question that was asked. And um, there are a lot of reasons to try and get local content uh, uh, down to the uh, um, uh, to the areas where it's uh, serving. D d does ISOC have any specific um, uh, methodology for trying to work with us? You know, to try and work with internet service providers there to do things like net flow analysis on their traffic uh, to see where their uh, their data is coming from. Uh, to try and work with the um, you know the big. Uh, CDNs uh, to try and get them into the regions and in particular if they can get those into the regions how do they solve the really big problem of who pays for the CDNs traffic uh, on the way in because if you've got a you know a whole bunch of people at an IP you've got a CDN cache or something like that that CDN cache is going to pull down an awful lot of data and ultimately somebody's got to pay, it, uh, pay for it the content providers are not going to want to do that and they feel that it's the responsibility of the uh, the local community to uh, uh, to pay for it um, and this is a difficult problem which I don't completely know how to solve so I'm wondering if you have any ideas about it. Um, yes and no. I mean we're definitely going to work with the community. I mean this is all you're hearing is um, how we, we try and leverage the rest of the community. I mean we have now gone from zero to one economist. Uh, <laughs> so it's a 100% increase. Yeah, or a thousand. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I think the idea is, you know, we're, we're talking to Martin, certainly talk to you, try and gather some data. Um, right now, if you go, you know, in some, again, in some projects I was doing before I came here, I would ask uh, the ISPs in, in one of these countries, um, what percentage of your, before there's an IXP, what percentage of your traffic is local? And they can't even really conceive the question is basically all of this. I mean, uh, what percentage is international? It's all of it, right? There's no local traffic, and then you put in the IXP. 
So definitely da more data is needed, but um, I think the low-hanging fruit is, is a country like Kenya, where you have data centers that are basically empty, and you have content, and you have good examples through Google and others. And then you move to countries where there's no data centers, and, and try and figure out what the content infrastructure is that needs to go along with the, um, the uh, IXP and the access infrastructure. Um, and I don't have answers to all those questions yet. That's what the project is going to, that we're kicking off is, is going to try and answer. Um, but I, you know, if you look at a country like um, Kenya again, the amount of money that's being spent to bring the traffic in has to far outweigh the savings of leaving it in, in Germany or in, in London, right? I mean, there has to be enough money on the table that everyone can be better off. The users, it will be faster, cheaper to get. Content providers will be giving, will be sending more traffic, um, and the ISPs will be saving a lot of that. But the, the specifics about CDNs and everything, those are those are some questions that we have to figure out. Thanks. Great, great. Thanks uh, for the questions. And of course, if you want to get um, any deeper into further conversation, please feel to ask anyone from the Internet Society offline to further discuss these issues. So, for a few. Um, for an overview of what um, some of our chapters are doing. Um, Shadeep from Nepal. Shadeep, are you here? Will the real Shadeep please stand up? Um, and I want to let you know that it is just not me picking on you, Shadeep. It was actually Joyce who suggested um, that um, you might be able to give us a view of uh, what a chapter does, some of the things that are of interest uh, to you in your region and in Nepal. <laughs> I was pretty shocked, I guess. Um, uh, at uh, regional level of, of Asia Pacific, what we have been trying to do is, uh, you know, we have been trying to get a lot of energy, especially with uh, young people, trying to come up with issues related to internet society. Uh, apart from that, we have been hosting a lot of events, uh, like uh, we recently did AIS. Uh, with AIS, we try to advocate the local country content uh, prospects and uh, you know um, prospects and challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, on our personal level, we have been trying to do events like let's talk about internet, where we talk about uh, internet at uh, uh, at the user level. You know, normal people, normal students, uh, and and it doesn't take much. You know, it's just a Facebook event where we call. Uh, students and all those who are interested to talk about internet to our place and we have a meeting room and we talk about internet so it's like easy I believe that uh, it's it's internet internet society is all about every individual that is standing here it's about bringing change to our society it's about doing that effort locally not internationally or looking for resources right you can do it at an individual level and you know with few steps, you can bring in change. And I believe uh, being part of the ISOC uh, community, I feel proud uh, that I'm here. I'm talking about my regional perspective, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, to make change. Uh, I know there might be issues with it, but still, I'm happy that I got a chance uh, to be part of ISOC community, and I'm proud to say I, I, am, I am with ISOC. So thank you. Thank you so much and for that really great overview and um, I mean it's stories like this that I think make us all proud to be part of the ISOC community whether we're working directly for ISOC, whether we're in a chapter or whether we're an individual member or a partner. Um, so are there other questions or responses from any, anything today? So, um, sorry, but she had your hand up here and then we'll go to those two. Thank you. Hi, I'm Shiva Mohammed. I took ambassador from Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you for having, I think on behalf of all of us, thank you for having us here. Um, I really didn't want to lose Karen's point at the beginning. I've been doing policy in Trinidad and Tobago for many years, ITG for D policy, and uh, the failings of technocentric policy is shockingly clear. And I think there's a big gap there that still needs to be addressed. And that triad of infrastructure, you know, the human, besides, you know, besides the main technical, the human and the governance elements are really essential still. And it's shocking that, you know what I mean, we, we kind of leave this gap unfilled. And what I'm really interested in is finding an intersection for those points. So 
right now I'm doing a study in Trinidad on policy and practice and we're seeing it again and again coming up where we have policy makers at the top level thinking that ICT is an IT thing and they delegate it to their technical people and that's great and technical people are brilliant of course but how do we streamline it to reach some of the real issues that are kind of using ICT as an enabler in countries like Trinidad and Tobago and also addressing some of the human rights issues. I think it's really important not to lose that. And I think uh, ISOC provides a really unique space to do that in a, in a very crowded room with many voices that sometimes have megaphones bigger than individual users can. So I think if we coalesce, it's something that's really important. Um, and I, I think it's something that we need to have some continuity and find kind of very concrete ways to do this beyond you know, just the theoretical rubric. That's great, and, and I'll just answer, and we can give you some more information ab about sort of that smart development approach, and, and I think that's a really good example, and that's something that we really want to push, is that you know, too many times still um, issues are put in boxes. Sometimes it's, oh, internet is just a technical thing, or this is just a technical thing, or this is just a policy thing, or this is just human capacity. For any project, again, at any scale, you really need to look at the intersection of those three. And that's really what's going to make it work. And that's one of the reasons why really pushing a multi-stakeholder dialogue is so key for so many of these issues, getting those different perspectives um, in the room. And it'll be great to follow, you, uh, follow up with you on uh, Trinidad and Tobago and those issues as well. Small island states is something that we're going to be taking a look at um, more in depth um, from an access perspective and an economic as well. So thanks for that question. Uh, there were two questions in the back. Um, Sylvia? Um, just wanted to say, I am, I'm an ISOC uh, member since 1996, and it has been like a, like a growing curve around my life. So it has been a constant in all my professional life. Um, started when George Sadowski was running the workshops and I met half of the colleagues that I'm now conspiring to make the internet a better place. I was a member of the ISOC chapter in Colombia, then I moved to Uruguay, worked with the chapter in Uruguay, now I'm living in Australia and I'm trying to work with the guys in, Uru in Australia as well. And it's like you carry this spirit with you and, um, and, you, and you keep the spirit of, of uh, bringing that interface between the technical community and the civil society and putting some common sense into all the deployments and all the discussions and all the, the conversations that are happening in a parallel track. So I really think that the role that the Internet Society uh, has con been doing for all these years is great. I kind of feel old when I think <laughs> of all the years that you have been around. Um, but I, I'm, I'm uh, very much uh, proud of part of, uh, of the Internet Society and whoever is in the room that is not Please join in. Thanks, Sylvia. Thanks a lot, Sylvia. And, uh, and, and you're right. I mean, one of the great things about um, uh, being in our community is that, you know, not only do you have professional colleagues, but you really grow friends um, uh, all over the world um, uh, that, uh, that you can count on and you know for many years. And Jane was talking about something about, you know, developing circles of trust when you're doing projects, and, and really that's what the Internet Society does on a really broad scale. Um, you know, there's individuals around the world that we know, you know, we can always reach out to and we can reach across um, other people in our community um, to get things done, and I think that's a, a really great benefit of the Internet Society. So we had a question here. Okay, hi, thank you. I'm Leonardus from Indonesia. Uh, to be honest, ISOC is uh, what a uh, new name in my head I just know I saw from the IGF uh, in the region. okay uh, my quick question is uh, because this is make me curious is there a, any uh, uh, programs or uh, that I saw do for changing or uh, impacting to uh, government internet regulation on a country or uh, countries. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we can. Um, Pharrell wants to answer that. One question: Is there anybody from the? Uh, in, do we have an Indonesian chapter? Not yet. 
okay, um, one of the things is that a lot of those can be driven through chapter activities. And when there's a specific request, um, again, I think as Jane was saying, is that if you, you, know, you come to request assistance, we can, we can um, work with you to figure out sort of what the best approach is and analysis. But let me um, turn it over to Terrell. Thanks for that, Karen. So thank you for that question. Actually, one of the programs that we started in January of last year, led by our public policy team, is a policy um, special guest to the IETF. And so to start bringing in regulators and demystifying some of the technology pieces. So those are some of the elements that we're, um, that we're addressing. I'll, I'll just add, uh, probably uh, you were not on the hall. So we do have received an application from Indonesian local community to have a Indonesian Jakarta chapter. Uh, so you know, uh, that's uh, our chapter really represent that mission in, in the local side of the community and they do uh, strive and, and they try to work with the governments as well. So somehow, you know, uh, I'll, I'll share my business card with you and, and you know, I'll try to connect you with that. So it's a process where we want more people from the community to join in and have a, a very strength uh, in uh, internet society chapter inside the nation. Thank you. My name is Walid al -Sakab. I'm proud to be the uh, founder of the Yemen chapter, Isaac Yemen, uh, recently founded. Thank you. <coughs> and I happen to know uh, some of the faces here, uh, including Naveed, whom I know from ICANN, as an ICANN fellow. And uh, it's, it's cru uh, one interesting thing that caught my attention is that uh, just a few weeks after I joined, uh, I thought I'm um, becoming a chapter a member and leader, I found this interesting debate on the mailing list. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you're <laughs> familiar with this debate about the sustainability, the financial sustainability of chapters. It was about the ISO Cambodian uh, chapter. And uh, I mean, what inspired me is that there was rather eagerness by ISO to help connect with this uh, chapter and see what problems it may have. I mean, obviously, for someone starting uh, to form a chapter and finding this, it's both something to worry about, but also something to be inspired about and understand that even if you face difficulties, you can't always try to seek help and try to coordinate. So, I mean, this is these are the impressions I have. If you want to comment about financial sustainability in areas of pro progression in that respect. Thank you, Walid. Um, maybe just... Um, I will not go again into the details of the Cambodia chapter. I, I think they have been uh, addressed. If they have not, I'm happy to have a discussion about it separately. But um, on the financial sustainability of the chapters, we are working, as you know, with um, in um, an administrative support group, actually a working group, um, to identify what kind of support is actually needed for uh, the chapters. Um, what we found so far is that there is a number of things that we can put in place which are not necessarily financial uh, contributions directly. So we're really trying to identify what exactly the issues are that were resources that are needed for the chapters and actually working through that list one by one to see how we can best support it, whether it's financial support or just general resources to, to, to support the chapters in the day-to-day -day, um, life. We're also looking at um, setting up a program and looking at a, num a training as well in terms of fundraising, specifically in the chapters, local fundraising. So um, as we understood, it, it is a challenge for, uh, for some of the chapters as it's not something they do in their day-to-day -day life. Um, and so we have been requested as well from some of the chapters to just get some training on how should we address this, how should we approach people to actually do some fundraising. So it is work in process. Um, so any suggestions, any questions are always welcome, of course. I hope that addresses your comments. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you, everybody. We're um, at the end of the time for our session. Um, so if there are any further questions, please feel free to um, come and approach and ask any uh, one of uh, uh, my colleagues or myself. And I'd like to thank you very much for attending this open session and uh, making it a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you.